Hey everybody, um, this is a piece titled, uh, The Basis for Defensism in Russia, by a guy named Ernest Erber. Um, it's part of a larger chapter within the, uh, neither, uh, Capitalism nor Socialism book by, uh, a collection of theories of bureaucratic collectivism put together by Habakern and Lipow. Um, and so there's a little introduction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the introduction to this overall chapter, um, which is only like a page. And then I'm going to read this obituary for Ernest Erber that I found on the uh, Workers' Liberty website. Um, so, yeah. And then I'm going to read the actual thing. So here we go. Chapter 3. The Defense of Collectivist Property. The German invasion of Russia in June of 1941 put those anti-Stalinist socialists who still had faith in the progressive role of the bureaucracy that was defending nationalized property in a very difficult position. Stalin was defending nationalized property in this instance in any attempt to exploit the popular anti-government fury that boiled over in the first few months after the invasion clearly ran the risk of aiding the Nazi invader. Behind the involved Marxistical argumentation, the participants in this debate were trying to find the answer to a difficult question. Should socialists suspend their opposition to Stalin for the duration? The qu this question was to become even more difficult in the period of the Cold War when Stalinism's opponent was not Nazi Germany but liberal capitalism. The lesson all socialists and many liberals and pacifists had drawn from World War I was that calling a halt to the class struggle in the interest of the war effort was a disaster for the labor and progressive movements. Footnote. The reader should be warned that here that be warned here that considerable confusion was introduced into this debate in left and socialist circles, generally by the tendency of all participants to use as part of their theoretical equipment Lenin's World War I slogan of, quote, revolutionary defeatism. That slogan seemed simply, seemed to imply that the choice was support your own government to the point of abandoning all opposition or favoring the victory of the enemy. Liberals and Stalinists, of course, I think it's actually a really important comment. I'm going to read that again. Uh, the reader should be warned here that, the con that considerable confusion was introduced into this debate in left and socialist circles, generally by the tendency of all participants to, to use as part of their theoretical equipment Lenin's World War I slogan of, quote, revolutionary defeatism. That slogan seemed to imply that the choice was to was support of your own government to the point of abandoning all opposition, of favoring the victory of the enemy. Liberals and Stalinists, of course, emphasized Lenin's slogan because in the face of Nazism, it was clear which choice should be made. They emphasized that unlike World War I, in this war there really were significant differences between both sides. They uh, for a discussion of the origins and disastrous consequences in World War I itself of this misleading slogan, see Hal Draper's The Myth of Lenin's Revolutionary Defeatism. This same series of articles also examines the other more successful attempts of Luxembourg and Trotsky to work out a political approach that more effectively dealt with this dilemma. The popular masses... Excuse me. Excuse me. Dealt with this dilemma. Okay, that's the end of, end of footnote. Sorry, I forgot I was reading a footnote. Uh, the governing classes in all belligerent countries simply took advantage of the situation to undermine all the gains won in decades of bitter struggle. The contending countries all moved at a faster or slower pace in the direction of military dictatorship. Did such an analysis apply also to Russia? Should socialists continue to oppose Stalin and his government and indeed put themselves at the head 
of the popular opposition to the bureaucracy, or should they, for the duration, ally themselves with Stalin's war effort? The first article in this section, basing itself on Shackman's emphasis on the progressive role of nationalized property, opted for the latter course, allying themselves with Stalin's war effort. Joseph Carter, in the second article, for the first time argued that nationalization per se was not progressive, and that the working class had nothing to defend in Stalin's government. Shackman's reply, in the form of a resolution, denounced Carter's view as an apology for capitalist restoration and emphasized that, under some conditions, it might be necessary for socialists to, quote, fight with the army of Stalin, end quote. End of introduction. Now I'm going to read an obituary uh, to Ernest Erber, who in this, the title of the obituary is uh, Ernie Erber. This is from February 2010, and it's by Barry Finger. I have uh, some pieces by Barry Finger um, on this channel. Um, and I have more ready to go up soon. Uh, but definitely check out Barry Finger. He's an editor. This is in uh, the Alliance for Workers Liberty, but Barry Finger is an American, and uh, he was or is on the editorial board of the journal um, or the magazine New Politics, which definitely has uh, or typically has a very um, interesting and uh, 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 analysis of world events. Um, I, uh, it, it emerges out of third camp Trotskyism in the United States. So it was founded, I believe, by, uh, <clears throat> Julius Jacobson. And I can't remember his wife's name. Just to tell you, it's on Wikipedia, it says Julius Jacobson was an American socialist writer and editor who edited Anvil, New International, and New Politics, all publications in the third camp tradition of socialism, a democratic Marxist tradition sometimes called, quote, Schachtmanite, after its significant theorist, Schacht Max Schachtman. Um, yeah, Phyllis Jack Jacobson. And it says here, New Politics is an independent socialist journal founded in 1961 and still published in the United States today. While it is inclusive of articles from a variety of left of center positions, the publication is historically associated with a quote. Um, one second. Yeah? Sorry. You might get an interest. Oh. Okay. Um. While it is inclusive of articles from a variety of left of center positions, the publication is historically associated with a quote, neither Washington nor Moscow, end quote, third camp democratic Marxist perspective, placing it typically to the left of the socialist democratic view, excuse me, the social democratic views in the journal Dissent. Um, I'm not sure about Dissent, but I believe Dissent might have its roots in, um, in like, uh, like, I guess, like, the more social democratic end of Schachtmanism, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's about Barry Finger. Ernie Erber. Ernest Erber died in February at age 96. Who died at, in February at age 96? Again, this is written in 2010 might be known to readers of Solidarity and members of the Alliance for Workers' Liberty only from Max Schachtman's memorable response to his 1948 resignation from the Workers' Party. The fate of the revolution, Russian Revolution carries large excerpts from Schachtman's spirited and anguished reply. Ernest Erber, who wrote under the party name Ernest Lund, was an original founder of the Socialist Workers' Party as it emerged in the 1930s from the American Socialist Party. Um, the Socialist Workers' Party being the um, Trotskyist Party of the United States. Um, at this time under, at, at, at this time, and I think for the next, you know, period uh, under the leadership of uh, James P. Cannon. But for a time, um, 
the other, it was James Buchanan and Max Schachtman were the leaders before Max Schachtman uh, uh, and, his, and his followers uh, started the Workers' Party in the late 1930s. I believe it was the 1930s. It might have been as late as 1940, but I think it was still while Trotsky was alive. Anyway, Ernst Erber, Ernest Erber was to become an early comrade of Drapers and Schachtmans and a leader of the later split from the Canaanites in 1940. When the Soviet Union invaded Finland, as a member of the Young People's Socialist League in the Socialist Party, Erber traveled to Spain and wrote a pamphlet for the YPSL on the Young, People, the Young People's Socialist League on the war. The Socialist Party had organized and funded the Debs column, and Erber was briefly to join the editorial staff of La P Bataille, or Bataille, the Pum newspaper. Again, uh, the Pum was a kind of a, an amalgamation of different dissidents, dissident communists. Uh, Erber served on the National Committee of the Workers' Party and served for a long time as managing editor of the New International, which was like a big theoretical um, journal of the Third Camp. Um, oh, 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 um, yeah, the Third Camp, and it's a... Uh, uh, yeah, because it says here, so I'm, I'm trying to remember my history, so I'm kind of like thinking out loud. The New International, I believe, was started when the Socialist Party, Workers' Party, was still unified, and then I guess it stayed with the uh, Shacktonites uh, oppositionists, or split the Shacktonite uh, groups, because it says, um, it's referring to the Workers' Party, sorry. Erber served on the National Committee of the Workers' Party and served for a time as managing editor of the New International and on the New International's editorial board until 1948 when he resigned. In the late 1940s, when the Workers' Party was debating its future role in the socialist movement, Erber was virtually alone in argue, urging, arguing to maintain the revolutionary perspective of the Workers' Party as a, quote, small mass party in opposition to the propaganda group the Independent Socialist League was to become. It was therefore all the more shocking when he resigned, as he had provided no advance warning of his anti-Leninist political disagreements with the party and had never raised his views on Bolshevism in the PC. Herbert had, in fact, just wrapped up an educational seminar on Bolshevism that he had presented to the Socialist Youth League. There were, however, inklings of his unease. Erber, in 1948, became increasingly unwilling to defend Bolshevism beyond the vulgarized attacks that equated Leninism with Stalinism. In retrospect, Erber represented a pro-socialist, capital S socialist, and shortly a pro-democratic party orientation that Schachtman himself was soon to adopt with far more devastating results for third camp socialism. Max Schachtman, like Ernest Erber, never did the, his thinking out loud, never squared his repudiation of a lifetime of revolutionary activity with his ostensible commitment to socialism. His indictment of Erber would read as a bill of particulars against his later self, had he not dragged most of his milieu into the same mire. Few indeed were those who maintained the political integrity to point out that irony. Erber was to go on outside of the Workers' Party to proclaim that he was a Democrat first and a Socialist second. Erber res Erber's resignation from the Workers' Party was not, however, simply a dress rehearsal for the tragedy to come. For unlike innumerable other defectors and renegades, Erber was also, also distinguished himself by endorsing Luxembourg's observation that only those who are prepared to go forward to Socialism will be prepared to defend the democracy that already exists. Erber should also be remembered in our movement for that. All right, so that's who Ernest Erber is. I am uh, completely new to this uh, topic, so it's exciting to learn uh, about a, a new contributor, a new uh, figure within these debates, um, which are also very new to me. I don't come from Trotskyism. Um, the only reason I'm aware of um, uh these groups is kind of secondhand by Max Schachtman and uh, learning about them. I first read about them in Lauren Goldner's like uh, 
discussion of like the 1968 in Berkeley and how there was kind of like a, he was part of like an independent so, uh, socialist club group, um, which was like a, um, which described, which was actually ex precisely what was like kind of, they were kind of like the heir of um, the groups that the uh, independent socialist league was like a proper, like propaganda groups. And they were kind of like, um, I don't really know exactly, but what the actual uh, core of them, but a lot of their uh, work was like education work, um, which is extremely important. Um, and also, uh, yeah, so it's like kind of like, a, um, and it was also, I think a lot of like, if you read that, listen to the one thing from, um, my channel is like, uh, from Schachtmanite Trotskyism to anarchism. I think like a lot of people that kind of like went from Trotskyism, like Wayne Price and other people to anarchism, um, started as a uh, third campus <laughs> so they come from one they move from one anti-stalinist group to the of the left to another anti-stalinist group um and i really think that like i think generally like the impact of the third camp even though like i, I feel like if you ask someone who's like a leftist if they know who max schachtman is they'll be like no they might know who how draper is I certainly didn't know who these people were until very recently, and I've kind of like known like sort of about like stuff like this for a little while. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how I first became interested in these topics. I learned the other day I actually gave my first uh, like kind of like lecture or like talk for the first time like a in in my real life uh, last night. Uh, about um Cornelius Castoriadis and I realized that um me talking takes way longer than um uh I thought it did I thought it did I thought the you know my brief my brief comments actually are not entirely so brief so uh, thank you for listening and bearing with me anyway here's the actual piece the basis for defensism in Russia by Ernest Erber Long and violent polemics were waged between Trotsky and his supporters on the one hand and ourselves on the other during the Russian invasions of Poland and Finland over the relation between the economy of a state and the character of its wars. Trotsky insisted in the case of Russia upon an automatic relationship, quote, progressive economy equals progressive war, end quote, was what Trotsky's formula boiled down to. This resulted in the contradiction of simultaneously denouncing the invasion as a, quote, blow at the world revolution, end quote, but characterizing the war invasion as, quote, progressive wars. We answered that no war that dealt a blow at the revolution could be progressive, since a war that was a blow, excuse me, we answered that no war that dealt a blow at the revolution could be progressive since it was precisely the effect of the war on advancing or retarding the proletarian revolution that determined whether it was progressive or reactionary. We did not, however, or could anyone who considered himself a Marxist say that there was no connection between the economy of a state and the character of its war. What we insisted on was that certain states could, on the basis of the same economy, fight both progressive and reactionary wars. Factors in addition to the economy would have to be weighed in connection with a specific war to determine its character. These would be rooted in the political, diplomatic, and military policies that preceded the war. The war that between Britain and Germany was an imperialist war on both sides because the economy of both countries forced them to fight for markets, raw materials, and outlets for surplus capital. It was a war over the redivision of the world. The war between Japan and China was imperialist on Japan's side and national defensive on China's side because the economy of Japan forced her to expand into China while China was struggling to create a unified national existence. In the war between Germany and Russia, we must begin by asking, quote, what is the nature of Russian economy, end quote. A defensist cannot discuss the character of the war with those who hold that Russia is a capitalist state. The discussion with them can only revolve around the question of the nature of Russian economy. 
If Russian economy is no different from that of Germany's or Britain's, then obviously the matter of defeatism or defensism requires no discussion. With those, however, who hold the, that Russian economy is basically different from the economy of the capitalist world, as does Schachtman, there is common ground on which to discuss an attitude toward the character of the war. <laughs> the Economic Conflict Between Russia and World Imperialism The Russian Revolution dealt world capitalism a double blow. First, it established a worker's state to act as both a beacon and a spur to the revolution in the rest of the world. We can refer to this as a political blow to capitalism. Second, the Russian Revolution wrested one-sixth of the earth from imperialism and threw up a monopoly of foreign trade to keep it free from imperialist penetration. We can refer to this as an economic blow to capitalism. The Stalinist counter-revolution has effectively wiped out the existence of Russia as a political threat to capitalism. Far from remaining merely passive, Stalinist Russia did its utmost in Spain, China, and Germany, France, and elsewhere to reassure the capitalist states that Russia would desired nothing else than the status quo to be left alone. There was no political concession too treacherous or revolting for Stalin. Stalin buried revolutions with an effectiveness that surpassed anything the capitalists themselves do. Again, um, check out the audiobook um, uh, Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell. It's a fantastic account of precisely such a process. <clears throat> but Stalin could not purchase peace and security, neither from the Anglo-French imperialists nor from Hitler. For the new exploiting class in Russia was forced to exist upon the nationalized economy they had appropriated from the revolution. The existence of the nationalized economy was possible only as long as a monopoly of foreign trade kept Russia beyond the reach of world imperialism. Economically, therefore, the Russia of Stalin remained as much a problem on the agenda of world imperialism as the Russia of Lenin. As capitalism declined, the problem became ever more acute. It is in this that the irrepressible conflict between Russia and world, world imperialism existed. In speaking of, quote, world imperialism, end quote, it is necessary to bear in mind that the term refers to both a generalized economic law and to definite national states. Economically, imperialism is the same system no matter which capitalist state carries it out. But politically, imperialism is the diplomatic and military activity of each particular imperialist state. Thus we speak of the law of imperialist expansion into economically backward states. Yet in connection with a specific expansion, for instance Ethiopia, it was undertaken by Italian imperialism in the face of resistance by British imperialism. Not love for the Ethiopians, but for their own imperialist interests motivated the British. The above must be borne in mind when discussing the conflict between Russian economy and world imperialism. Why the concerted imperialist attack did not occur. The years following the revolution in 1917 saw feverish activities on the part of the imperialists against the Soviet Union. The first activities consisted of small-scale intervention. Americans at Archangel, Japanese at Vladivostok, <laughs> never pronounced that right, in a smooth way at least, French in the Black Sea, and material assistance to the White Guard enemies. As long as the war lasted, the Germans were also active against the Soviets in Finland and the Ukraine. Following the German Revolution, the German bourgeoisie was unable to act against the Soviets on the German bourgeoisie's own and unwilling to act as the agents of French and British imperialism. To act as the agents of French and British imperialism would have only established Anglo-French imperialism on both of Germany's frontiers and make the resurrection of German military strength all the more difficult. Following the failure to successfully utilize Poland against the Soviet Union in 1921, the British imperialists made preparations for a direct intervention. The militant response of the British working class with a general strike put an end to these moves. The German bourgeoisie answered the anti-Soviet agitation of Anglo-French imperialism with the Treaty of Ropolo, uh, Ropolo, a German-Soviet pact for diplomatic and military collaboration. The pact was not the inspiration of German social democracy, but of the Reichswehr general staff. 
the stronghold of the most aggressive German nationalists. Russian collaboration represented to the Germans both a weapon against the Anglo-French, excuse me, against Anglo-French imperialism and a means of blackmailing them. This tactic foreshadowed the policy of Nazism, which was nothing else but the national chauvinist element in complete control. <laughs> From 1921 until 1933, the existence of a strong revolutionary movement in Central Europe and the anti-war sentiments of the British and French working classes prevented any further imperialist adventures against Russia. However, the victory of Hitler opened a new epoch. Beginning in Germany, the proletarian movements of Central Europe were smashed one by one. In the proletarian movements of Central Europe's place arose the new military might of German imperialism. But German imperialism was not only a threat to the Soviet Union. German imperialism was also a threat to Anglo-French hegemony. Even if Germany struck at Russia first, Anglo-French imperialism would have little consol consolation. For the German organization of Russian resources would again make her the first military power on the continent and place France at her mercy. The result was her feverish and contradictory diplomacy of England and France from the advent of Hitler to the outbreak of the war. First efforts to placate Germany with loans, permission to rebuild Germany's navy, etc., then the stalin laval Pact, then the Munich Peace, then feverish efforts for a British-Russian Pact, then the war. From this review, it becomes apparent that the nature of the conflict between Germany and Anglo-French imperialism was just that a joint imperialist attack became ever more improbable. The conflict between Anglo-American imperialism and Japan in the Far East had the same result. History had cast Stalinist Russia for the role of an ally of one of the imperialist camps. Had England been willing to sign a second Munich Pact over the body of Poland, it is highly probable that German imperialism would have launched its first offensive against Russia, but another appeasement would have cost Britain every continental ally with the possible exception of France. When Hitler realized that a second Munich was out of the question, Hitler chose the pact with Stalin and the war against Britain first. But the war against Britain has bogged down. The channel could not be blitzed. The prospect is a long war. Russian supplies now became imperative for Germany. The economic organization of Russia by German imperialism would solve both its historic objective and German imperialism's immediate military needs. The long-awaited imperialist attack on Russia is taking place. The Hitler-Stalin Pact and Russian Imperialism For the Kremlin, the Pact of Hitler promised two advantages, A, another chance to escape involvement in the war, and B, the opportunity of sharing in the conquest of German imperialism. But did not the Russian participation in the division of Poland, the conquest of the Baltic states, etc., prove that Russian participation in the war was identical with that of Germany? Superficially, it was identical. In both cases, armies attacked and occupied territories. But fundamentally, it was different. The imperialism of Russia was at the primitive of the pr that primitive kind, found in embryonic form, in every exploiting class, and awaiting but the opportunity to become active. I'm going to repeat that again. The imperialism of Russia was that primitive kind, found in embryonic form, in every exploiting class, and waiting but the opportunity to become active. Every exploiting class seeks to perpetuate that exploiting class's self against internal and external foes. Perpetuating an exploiting class's self against internal and external foes requires military and economic strength. An opportunity to increase that exploiting, exploiting class, says military and economic strength, is therefore eagerly accepted. Parts of Poland and fin Finland, Bessarabia, and the Baltic states were to be picked up, practically for a song. 
the Russian rulers would truly have been altruist had they declined the invitation. <laughs> but is this the same as modern finance imperialism with its, quote, expand or die, end quote? Has anyone yet proven that Russian expansion was forced by internal economic pressures? Has anyone yet explained why Russia took such modest slices of Finnish territory when Russia could have extracted more if Finnish resources were vital to her? Or why Russia has relinquished the nickel mines? Or why Russia chose territory that had primarily little economic value? Russian imperialism has perhaps something in common with Chinese imperialism in Tibet, but nothing in common with modern finance imperialism. <laughs> Stalin's war against Finland and Stalin's war against Germany. The invasion of Poland and Finland was an attempt by the Kremlin to strengthen the Kremlin's own reactionary rule. Since it made the workers of the occupied territories victims of nationalist illusions and agents of the occupied territories' own national bourgeoisie and through them of world imperialism, the Soviet occupation lowered their revolutionary consciousness and retarded their class development. This constituted a blow at the world revolution. The revolts in the Baltic states have revealed that Stalin had not turned them into fortresses, but rather into prisons with inmates who were prepared to mutiny at the first opportunity. This has justified our position that military occupation of buffer territory at the expense of alienating the support of workers, excuse me, of the workers of the world would be a loss not a gain, to the defensive efforts of the Kremlin. The purposes, the execution, and results of the Soviet occupations were thoroughly reactionary. Can we, however, say the same for the Kremlin's attempts to defend Russia against German imperialism? In the case of the conflict between Germany and British Empire, with who is waging a defensive war and who an offensive war, all finance imperialism is, by finance imperialism's very nature, aggressive. If Germany attacked first, it only meant that the solution to Germany's economic problems could not bear as long a postponement as the economic problems of Britain and France. But can we also say that the conflict between Germany and Russia is basically an attempt to redivide the world? We can say that on Germany's side, the conflict between Germany and Russia was caused by the pressure of German economy upon the frontiers of Russia. But can we say that it was also caused by the pressure of Russian economy on the frontiers of Germany? Germany's attack on Russia is so obviously a predatory imperialist raid against Russian economic resources that no one, no one, has yet tried to attribute it to anything else. Is the reactionary war against Poland and Finland, undertaken on the initiative of the Kremlin, being repeated in the attempt of the Kremlin to resist German imperialism? The answer is so obviously no that it seems a bit childish to have to deal with the question in these terms. Russia is participating in this war because the Kremlin is fighting for its life. Further concessions to Hitler would have so lowered Russia's prestige and strength within the country as to make Russia vulnerable to its internal enemies, either of the right or the left. True, it turned down Hitler's demands and chose to fight because its own neck was at stake. But why did Negrin fight? Why did Hale Selassie, excuse me, Selassie fight? Why does Chiang Kai-shek fight? Stalin can save his own neck only by resisting German imperialism. In doing this, his interests coincide with those of the world proletariat. Russia's defense against Germany is a progressive war. How the outcome of the Russo-German War will affect world revolution. Victory or defeat for either Germany or the British Empire will offer the proletariat as great or as small a perspective for revolution. The destruction of the British Empire will open up an epoch of colonial revolutions in Asia and Africa, which might prove to be the Achilles heel of, quote, victorious German imperialism. 
The defeat, the defeat of Germany will liberate Europe and once more offer the proletariat an opportunity to play its historic role. What will Hitler's conquest of Russia offer the world proletariat? The only answer that might be given, we hope never in our ranks, is that it will destroy Stalinism. This program has long ago been written for, quote, Trotskyism, not by revolutionists, but by the GPU and Stalin's pen prostitutes. The destruction of the Stalin regime by the Russian proletariat would, of course, mean the destruction of Stalinism everywhere. The destruction of the Stalin regime by Hitler would, aside from its reactionary consequences, forever prevent history from putting the Stalinist lies about the Soviet, quote, paradise to the test. The Stalinist dupes would not become revolutionists because Hitler destroyed Stalinism. The Stalinist dupes would carry their illusions about the Soviet Union to their grave. The effect of an imperialist conquest of Russia was very ably described by Max Schachtman in the December 1940 issue of the New International. Bracket. The author here quotes the passage which appears above in which the reduction of Russia to, quote, a somewhat more advanced India, end quote, is predicted. That's uh, from uh, Habakkuk, end, end bracket. Comrade Shackman, however, would defend Russia against the above consequences only in case of a combined imperialist attack in which Russia would have no allies. Why such a combined attack became virtually impossible was dealt with above. But there are those who argue that Hitler is not invading the Soviet Union primarily to destroy the nationalized economy and make the nationalized economy a German colony. Hitler's primary concern, they say, is to defeat Great Britain. The Russian campaign is merely, exclamation point, a raid to secure the resources with which to continue his main war. True, perhaps, but how absurd when used to define the character of the war. Hitler, likewise, was not primarily interested in expropriating the German Jews. He only wanted their resources for his war against Britain. Um, that turned out not to be true. True, but little, perhaps of little comfort for, to the Jews. But what would the effect of a Russian victory be? The possibility of a Russian victory without the support of proletarian revolutions in the West is extremely hypothetical. But we can be sure that news of serious German reverses tomorrow would set the wheels in motion in Britain for an understanding with Germany. Is anyone so harebrained to believe that Britain would still, excuse me, would turn over the task of organizing Central Europe to Stalin? But if the European Revolution breaks out before Hitler has smashed Stalin, will it not fall victim to Stalinism as did the Spanish Revolution? Of this we have no guarantee. All we can say is that with the rise of the revolutionary current, the revolutionary Marxists can again swim with the stream and seek to win it for their program. We can ask for no more. Stalin's Relations with Anglo-American Imperialism Quote, war is a continuation of politics by other means, end quote, has long been accepted as a guide rule by Marxists. But progressive politics in time of general imperialist war often became inseparable from one of the imperial camps and thereby lose their progressive character. In the last war, the struggle of the Arabs against the Turkish Empire became, became merged with the reactionary struggle of British imperialism to control the Near East. The struggle of Serbia for national unity and independence became merged with the struggle of Russia to break up the Austro-Hungarian Empire and control the Balkans. The struggle of Belgium to maintain its national independence became merged with the struggle of Anglo-French imperialism to control the continent. China was ordered by the Allied imperialists to declare war on Germany. The nationalist revolutionary movements of, movement of the Czechs was enlisted by the Allies against Germany. The fighting organizations of the Polish nationalists were enrolled by the, by the Central Powers. The German revolutionary movement entered into military relations with the Germans. Submarines landed arms on the Irish coast and conveyed information between Ireland and Germany. But revolutionary Marxists hailed and supported the uprising of the Nash Irish nationalists against British rule in 1916.
These examples illustrate the fact that the mere alliance with a reactionary force for military reasons does not affect the progressive nature of a struggle. What is important is the extent to which the progressive side of the war can maintain its independence. Had the Ethiopians risen in revolt against Italian rule at the outbreak of the war and accepted British arms, would this have changed the revolutionary content of their struggle? The fact that they rose at a time when Italy was occupied in a war with Britain would have attested to their perspicacity, but would not have changed the character of their struggle. But their current role as auxiliaries of the British army in conquering Ethiopia for British imperialism has no progressive content whatsoever. Chiang Kai-shek has long been acting as an ally of British and American imperialism in China. American imperialism has already given him more financial, material, and diplomatic support than it will ever give Russia. American engineers, military advisors, aviators, and other specialists have long been part of the Chinese forces. Roosevelt seeks volunteers for China's army by offering to accept service there as equivalent to service in America's own army and therefore release them from the draft obligation. Has this changed the character of China's war? No. Will an American declaration of war against Japan alter the situation? It might. We would have to wait and see. Naval struggles in the Pacific between Japan and America and military operations on the Philippines would not affect the character of China's war. Those who would become defeatists in China at such a time would, in effect, be punishing China for remaining at war with Japan while Japan was being attacked by a third power. Was the American Revolution any less historically progressive because the American Revolution was accomplished with the aid of Louis XIV's army and navy? I don't think that's a correct um, name. Um, wouldn't that be uh, Louis XVI's? Isn't that the king who died? Louis the Fourteenth was earlier. Anyway, if, however, the Chiang Kai-shek government were reduced to a mere facade for American imperialism, the character of the war would obviously change. Its outcome would only determine whether Japanese or American imperialism would exploit China. The world proletariat has no interest in this question. The world proletariat rejects both imperialisms. The argument that Russia takes part in the war in a reactionary manner because Russia is allied to Anglo-American imperialism becomes at first incomprehensible and then ludicrous. She has merely, quote, switched sides, end quote, is the argument. That she is, quote, switched sides is incontestable. But this would only have validity if we have, had been defeatist during the Finnish war on grounds that Russia was allied to Germany. This was not the case. We were defeatist because the alliance with Germany had a reactionary purpose, the conquest of new territory by the Kremlin. Is the purpose, today, of the world alliance with Anglo-American imperialism? How utterly absurd. What the Kremlin may do tomorrow, we will leave until tomorrow. No one has yet asked us to be defeatist in China on the grounds that Chiang Kai-shek has designs upon Japan, which he will realize after crushing the Japanese army. The argument that the alliance with Anglo-American imperialism makes Russia's war reactionary is nothing but the other side of the coin from the Stalinist argument that the same alliance makes the war of Anglo-American imperialism progressive. Those who hold that it is possible for Russia to fight a progressive war against imperialist encroachment upon her territory and who refuse to be for Russian defense today can only do so on one basis. That Stalin has already become a mere facade for the Anglo-American imperialists and turned the country over to the Anglo-American imperialists. That this might take place is improbable but not impossible. In the event it will be immaterial whether Russia becomes a colony of Germany or of Anglo-American imperialism. But since when do we base our strategy of today on the possibility of tomorrow? Stalin's alliance with Anglo-American imperialism today does not give Anglo-American imperialism one-tenth as much entry to Russia as the Anglo-American alliance with China gives it entry to the latter country.
To be consistent, those who hold that Russia is fighting a reactionary war by virtue of her alliance must certainly say the same for China. The lines of defeatism and defensism tested in action. An attitude toward the character of a war must be based on the fundamental factors. Strategy of the world revolution, nature of imperialism, character of the Russian economy, etc. But the position based on these considerations must also coincide with the obvious tactics of the revolutionary struggle. If they do not, something is wrong with the position. It was in this test that the line of Trotsky on the Polish and Finnish events bogged down worst. It bogged down so badly that a Finnish civil war had to be discovered to bolster it. The revolutionary defeatist in Russia today must tell the workers to continue the class struggle without regard for the class struggle's effect on the military front against Germany. This could only be justified with the argument that a German conquest of Russia is no different for the world proletariat than a German conquest of France. The quotation from Schachmann has already pointed out the significant difference. Or the defeatist would have to become preposterous and tell the Russian worker that the country was already in the hands of imperialism, Anglo-American imperialism, and that resistance to German imperialism is only in the interest of Wall Street and London investments. Or would the defeatists tell the Russian worker that there are only three camps in this war, two imperialist camps and the revolutionary camp, and that Russia is part of one of the imperialist camps? If it is the slogan of the third camp that has led our defeatists astray, then the motion of Comrade Coolidge of a year ago to expunge all reference to the third camp from our documents was absolutely correct. The quote third camp as an agitational slogan was very much in order. But the quote third camp in the sense of military lineups which precludes the possibility of a military alliance between a progressive and a reactionary force, this is a snare and a delusion. The sooner Marxist education roots it out of our movement, the sooner will the damage be undone. Basing ourselves on this line, the defeatist would seek to institute a mass movement against the Kremlin on the demand that it cease its imperialist war against Germany. The slogan of, quote, peace in time of war is very revolutionary, but what would our movement say tomorrow if Stalin made peace which could only take place on Hitler's terms? We would denounce Stalin as a capitulator and a traitor. Why? We did not do it when he made peace with Finland. As true defeatists, we welcomed the latter. Would we welcome peace with German imperialism? Would the defeatist ever be made be able to explain to a Russian worker why he should take the manufacture and transport of supplies to China into account when waging the struggle against Stalin, but not the needs of the Russian front against Germany? How explain to the Russian worker that the conquest of China by Japan is of direct consequence to him? But the conquest of Russia by Germany does not matter sufficiently to require defensive efforts. Sorry, that was read weird. How explain to the Russian worker that the conquest of China by Japan is a direct consequence to the Russian worker, but the conquest of Russia by Germany does not matter sufficiently to require defensive efforts? The program of the Russian revolutionary defenses would be along the following lines, quote, no political support to the Stalin regime, only a democratically constituted workers regime can victoriously defend the Soviet Union. Continue the struggle for the overthrow of the bureaucratic exploiters as the first step in the organization of defense against German imperialism. On guard against the tendency of the Kremlin to capitulate to Hitler. Quote, war at the front, revolution in the rear, end quote. Support to all mass movements against the Kremlin on a defensist basis, i.e. choice of those weapons of struggle that will not weaken the front. Election of committees in the shops, villages, and armed forces is first step toward reconstituting Soviets. Freedom of press, speech, and organization. Dissolution of the GPU and creation of workers' vigilance committees. Release of all political prisoners held for revolutionary activity against the Stalin regime. For a free and independent Soviet Ukraine. For self-determination for all national minorities oppressed by the Kremlin regime. End quote. New International, August 
Hitler's invasion of Russia. Oh, shoot. Okay, yeah, that's the end of it. Um, sorry, there's another uh, piece, but it's like weird. It looks like it's going to be another section, but it's just another piece. So thanks for listening.